Uh, good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody feeling right now? Good? Yeah, still awake? All right. I'll try to get you out of here at a semi-decent time. They told me I had the rest of the evening, so you're in luck. Um, so I have the distinct honor of being able to speak to you today about innovation, living in that sense of wonderment, finding that creativity again. And the person that I'm going to use to try to help us learn how to be innovative is Leonardo da Vinci. Now, by a show of hands, who has heard of Leonardo da Vinci? Yeah, most of you. Not everybody raised their hands, though, so apparently not everybody has, or they just don't care. Um, all right, well, uh, the next one is, who or what did Leonardo do? Just yell it out. Painter. Painter. Art. Got it. Inventor. All right. So the vast majority that I heard was artist and painter. And yes, that's primarily what people think about when they think about Leonardo. But if you ask Leonardo himself what he was, he wouldn't answer just a singular identity. That was the unique thing about Leonardo. He lived in the limitless. He did not see himself as just one thing. And that really is one of the foundational things of his innovation. Because to be innovative, you first have to see yourself capable of it. Because innovation is not the mastery of just the what is, but it's exploration of the what if. So by show of hands again, how many of you out there are notorious like note takers where you put like sticky notes to remind yourself or maybe you have a whiteboard, there's like three of you or you do use your calendar on your phone, I'm a big phone guy. All right, so some of you, some of you, good. Well, you're in good company because Leonardo da Vinci himself was an avid note taker and we're really lucky that he was such an avid note taker because we have reams and volumes of his sketchbooks, of everything he would think about, of the multidisciplinary aspect of who Leonardo was. And it shows us everything that he was into, everything that he aspired to learn about. He studied uh, engineering, both mechanical and civil. He studied aerospace, trying to create flying machines, all sorts of interesting contraptions for weapons of war. I don't see, know if you see the one on the bottom left where it's almost like a lawnmower to run over people. Um, and yes, he studied ornithology, studied botany, optics, ophthalmology, and he studied art. And that was the unique thing about Leonardo. He lived in the limitless. He did not keep himself within a box that Oftentimes, we ourselves put ourselves in, or society does, or culture does, or the way we grew up. And that's the thing about Leonardo. He wouldn't have answered one thing. He lived with boundless boundaries. And the funny thing is that all of us here, at one point in our lives, lived that way as well. If we had asked us at one point of our lives, we would have said that we could be so many things. When we were children, if you ask a kid, I have an 11-year-old. I'm sure, how many of you, by show of hands, have kids? You've experienced this? All right, most of us have children. So if you ask a kid, or maybe if you're younger, you have a niece or nephew, what they, what they can be when they grow up, they have this unlimited sense of capability. If you ask a child what they can be within a year, within a month, within a day, within one sentence, they can see themselves as unlimited potential. You ask a child, what can they do? What are you gonna do when you grow up? Oh, I could be president, or I could be a doctor, or I could be a lawyer, I could maybe be a police officer, or maybe I can even be a ninja dinosaur bounty hunter. It's amazing. They could do anything. But time, time, time is this interesting thing to us. Time has this amazing palette of colors to which it can choose to paint over how we view ourselves, how we see our own capabilities. But Leonardo maintained that sense of wonder. He maintained the art of the possible. But Leonardo did struggle 
He did have some self-doubt. He was human. He had some issues. And Leonardo actually had a, a time in his life when he was having this end-of-life crisis. Uh, he had reached 30. Um, and for, in his time period, in his defense, 30 is, statistically speaking, could be his end of life. Um, so he wasn't as successful as he had hoped for in his career. He was living in Florence where he grew up, and he had some success, but not exactly where he wanted to be. And he had heard that the, the ruler of Milan had put out a decree looking for civil servants. So Leonardo wanted to change his luck. So he created a curriculum vitae. So here you actually have a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's resume. And in this resume, he spent, he wrote 10 paragraphs of all the things that he thought he could do, of what a civil servant or should be doing, what a ruler would, of a city-state would be interested to hire him on. So he wrote all sorts of things about how he could build aqueducts, how he could build bridges, how he could build weapons of war like the lawnmower you saw how he could build all sorts of buildings for the public good. And it wasn't until the very last sentence that he said, oh, and likewise in painting, I can do everything possible. <laughs> but that was the thing about Leonardo. It's the fact that he didn't see himself as just one thing. He was unbound, limitless. And you can see this, his, how his thought process would go from one thing to another, how he wanted to learn everything possible, how he viewed himself not just an engineer, not just as a scientist, not just as a humanitarian, not just as an artist, but he viewed himself as both at the same time. If you ask Leonardo to create a column to hold up this roof, he would build it adequately, strong to be able to support it, to meet all the regulatory standards. It would be an amazing piece of architecture. But at the same time, it would equally be a beautiful piece of art. He had no distinction when he was creating something. And you can see that it took one page uh, out of his uh, sketchbooks. And you can see how this symbiosis of both the art and the science at the same time. At the very top, there's a sketch of a very famous painting of his. But it's kind of rudimentary. Can anybody make out what it is? OK, everybody can make out what it is. All right, so yes, it's The Last Supper. So in the, there's the Last Supper at the very top of the page, and then right underneath that, there's the squaring of a circle. I didn't ask you that one. And then underneath that is mirror script writing. So for those of you who don't know, mirror script writing was something that Leonardo used uh, so that he could uh, keep his secrets away from people in case he lost his sketchbooks or something of that nature. So he would actually use a mirror and write as he looked in the mirror. That way it was the exact reflection of what he actually was writing. But this was the unique thing about Leonardo, that he could go from one to the other. And it's the fact that he lived in the, with the ability to be anything. And sometimes we lose that. We lose the thought process that we are capable of anything. And we get caught up in that we are just one thing. So I ask you, when you were children, what did you want to do? What are you capable of today? When I was a child, I uh, grew up with, uh, my father was from Dominican Republic. That's him on the top left, uh, Juan. He, uh, he came to Puerto Rico because his father wanted to send him to America to study abroad because of, of various reasons. He met my mother, Yvonne. Uh, while in Puerto Rico, and they got married, they had three children. My brother Juan there on the left, my sister Carmen, and then me on the bottom right. Um, and I know, my mother tortured me with that bowl cut, and I cursed that hair on that very day, and now you see what happens. Um, now I miss the bowl cut. But the thing about growing up with an immigrant father in a traditional Hispanic family is that, I think Dr. Kapadia mentioned this also, you really only had three options, when you did well in school at least, of what you could do when you grew up. You could be a physician, you could be an engineer, like my father, or you could be a lawyer. 
I have right now, my parents tell a different story, but I can only tell the way I remember it. So I, however, wanted to be a thespian. I loved theater. I loved the arts, the humanities. I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to be on TV. I wanted to be night writer. I loved all that stuff. But out of the options that I was given, I chose physician because I thought that was the most noble of the opportunities. But the thing was that I felt like my life was very predetermined, very predestined, that I had no options, that my sense of wonder was kind of snuffed out. And the thing is that we as physicians in our training oftentimes go through such a very rigorous pathway where we're told what to do, when to do it. At this point in your career, you have to take a test. Oh, guess what? In another year, you're going to take another test. One year, you're going to be living here. This person is your boss for the next month. Next two weeks, you're on that rotation. In six months, you'll get two weeks off. We are constantly being told, these are the boxes you have to check. These are the hoops you have to jump through. And that could be very stifling, very difficult to get out of that. Leonardo, however, he came from a very different situation. He was the illegitimate son of a notary, born outside of Florence. And it was this fateful act, the fact that he was born out of wedlock, that allowed us to have the master in Leonardo that we know today. Because Leonardo, if he had been born in wedlock, at the time period, he would have been, have to follow in his footsteps of his father. So instead of having Leonardo da Vinci, master painter, master inventor, we would have Leo, the notary. And I wouldn't be up here talking to you about him today. So interesting the way life is, but it was this fact that he wasn't, he had to teach himself. He was self-taught. He was able to seek out his own path that allowed him to study everything that he wanted to aspire to be, that allowed him to never have one singular identity, that allowed him to study the sciences he wanted to, how he wanted to, as in depth as he wanted to, and the arts that he wanted to. The way we're taught oftentimes is very objective, very scientific. Leonardo had the capability to be free in both the arts and the sciences and to strengthen one with the other so that any time he faced a challenge, he could view it through the objective lens of science and the subjective lens of art. But since he viewed them at the same time with both, it was through a kaleidoscope of creativity. You can see that in so many of his works the way he would study a bird in flight. You see the objective lens of science, the way he would study anatomy. But at the same time, all these pieces of work could be art. You could see people buying this and putting them on the wall. The way he would study the eddies within the water flow or botany. Plants or with the way that animals move. This was Leonardo, science begetting art, art begetting science, to live in wonder. Everything he viewed, he saw inspiration in, and we too can live this way. We too can regain this to be innovators within our own lives, professionally and personally to think about the fact that the universe has evolved a way for it to know itself and to explore itself in us, in humanity, is quite astounding. And the fact that we may be the only way the universe has to explore itself is humbling. We talked about how Leonardo wrote a lot of notes as a few of us do in the audience. Another skill set that we can learn from that allowed him to be creative and innovative was the fact that he had an insatiable curiosity. 
He was constantly going out and seeking to learn new things. He was always willing to ask questions, to understand the scope of his limitations, to seek out those that could teach him more, either more knowledge or more wisdom, to stretch himself beyond his comfort zone so he could grow and so he could weave that fabric into who he was. He would look for master mathematicians, whether it was a physician or an accountant to teach him some sort of arithmetic. He would look for engineers to teach him about a new uh, mechanical contraption. He would talk to an architect or a bombardier to ask exactly how did they build that wall without any gaps. And that's the thing about Leonardo. Many of his biographers often talk about how he was a genius, that what he did, no one could aspire to do. But I disagree. Leonardo was uniquely human. He had fits and tantrums. He procrastinated. What he did and how he was innovative was human skills, which he continually worked on. Insatiable curiosity, willing to be wrong, looking to ask questions, looking to those who knew more than you, that is something that we're uniquely trained as, as physicians, more so than almost any other industry. We're constantly trained to critically think and problem solve. We're constantly trained that if we run into a problem, get a consult. Whether it's a subspecialist or if it's in your own specialty, just a curbside. Call, phone a friend. Don't think you're that cool that you know all the answers. That's something that we've been trained to do. So we are uniquely prepared to follow suit as Leonardo. People often ask me, Jose, how did you get involved with NASA? How did, I mean, how did you get involved with Hyperloop, AI, Watson? How, how, tell me, how did, what's the beginning? Are you, what's your background? Are you an engineer? Are you a computer scientist before, before you did med school? No, I didn't do any of that. All I simply did was take the critical thinking skills, the insatiable learning, the skill sets that we learned in medical school, and I went outside my comfort zone, and I challenged myself with something new. I took one skill set and applied it to something else, and that's where you get innovation. When you sit people down and have them tackle a new problem that have different backgrounds and different thought processes, that's how innovation happens. It's not when you sit people in the room that only have a singular thought process. This activity or this seeking of knowledge constantly to improve himself, to get better, caused Leonardo's skill sets to constantly improve. It wasn't just one thing for the other. If he studied one science, it begat a better science. If he, be if he learned art, it improved his science. If he learned science, it improved his art. And you can see this in so many of his works. One example that I think is is, emulates this perfectly, is the Vitruvian Man. The Vitruvian Man, uh, you guys have probably seen this at some point based on the architect Vitruvius, and the concept that four fingers equal a palm, four palm into a cubit, six cubits into a man, uh, 24 palms equal a man. But it's an iconic combination of a perfectly proportioned man inside a circle and inside a square. And you can see this in so many of his other works. Look at the way he would study the anatomy of the human face, the bony structures of the skull, the way the pterygoid plates and the underlying zygomas supported the musculature and the sinew, the muscles of mastication, looking at how they connected with the lips underneath the eyes. You could see how his deep study of anatomy would lead to one of the most iconic smiles in human history, where artists talk about it was not just his play on anatomy, but his knowledge of optics, where when you look at the Mona Lisa, if you don't look directly at her, it kind of looks like she's smiling, a little sly smirk. But then when you try to see her, try to catch her, and if she's flirting with you out of the corner of your eye, you look directly at her lips, and it seems to go away. The way he would study the upper torso, the anatomy, of 
the pectoralis, the latissimus dorsi, the deltoids, biceps, the triceps, the way they integrated with the chest wall, the way they attached with the platysmus to the bottom of the neck. You can see how that comes out in his depiction of St. Jerome in the wilderness. Science begetting art. Art begetting science. His study of mathematics and optics, the way light reflected, refracted, the way it would interact as it touched your eye, this led to what artists call the Renaissance linear perspective, where all the angles of light and all the vision attracts the viewer, you, us, to look at the center of the portrait, where Christ sits amongst his disciples. This was the combination of science and art, art and science, two sides of one creative coin. And there are plenty of modern equivalents with this as well. I think the most iconic is the one on the left, form and function, right? The iPhone, one that we've seen all the time. The one on the right is Hyperloop, a project that I work on, new form of transportation. Steve Jobs used to give uh, speeches all the time, and there was a presentation he would give, one slide that he was very known for, in which he would put a big intersection. And one road was engineering, the other road was art. And he used to say, when you stand right there at the center of that intersection, what occurs there? The answer was creativity and innovation, combination of engineering and art. Leonardo isn't the only innovator that used this combination of art and science to be innovative, to be creative. There are plenty of others. Ada Lovelace is the lady on the left. She was touted to create the first computational machine in the 1800s. Her mother, a famous mathematician. Her father, Lord Byron. And it wasn't just that she was a progeny or a combination of a scientist and artist. She also surrounded herself with people that stretched these skill sets. She was friends with people like Michael Faraday, Charles Dickens. These people added to her, to her skill sets like Leonardo. She sought them out. And she said that her practice, as she called it, was poetical science. The guy on the right, you guys know who he is. Some of you don't like him, some of you do. Uh, obviously, Albert Einstein. We all know of what he did, um, both in quantum physics and mathematics and in nuclear physics. Obviously, a very, very intelligent man. But when he struggled with a mathematical problem, he would often go and play the violin. Because he said that that stimulated him to be able to solve the scientific and mathematic challenges. It was his love and his combination of art. But Leonardo remains weird, matchlessly weird, and nothing to be done about it. And this is by uh, a critic from The New Yorker. And this is true, he was weird. Why? Because anyone who dares to think differently will be always considered odd. Anyone who challenges the status quo will always be considered odd. Leonardo was a misfit. He was a rebel. And he was an innovator because he always wanted to be different. He never saw himself as just one thing. But was he a genius or was he human? There's an interesting thing that happens with luminaries throughout human history. People that reach success in a way that we're, most of us aren't used to it. We tend to either geniify them, we tend to mystify the works that they do, and at some point, sometimes we even deify them. There was, but none of this was actually genius. It wasn't metaphysical. Everything Leonardo did was uniquely human. Everything he studied were skill sets that we can apply to our own lives, that we can learn from, that we can cultivate and nurture to regain creativity, to be innovative. At the beginning of his life, 
He was illegitimate. He had no schooling whatsoever. He could barely read and write. But it allowed him to explore, in a way, human skill sets that we have now one of the greatest masters of all time. These skills of imagination, sense of wonder, insatiable curiosity, lifelong learning like we're doing here right now, willing to ask questions, willing to be wrong, willing to stretch himself beyond his comfort zone. These are the seeds of innovation. This is what leads to creativity. So, I challenge you, focus on these things that Leonardo did, these human qualities. These aren't things that are beyond us. There was a famous uh, biographer of Leonardo, Giorgio Vasari. He was a 16th century painter. And he used to say that Leonardo was, that occasionally, or sometimes, out of supernatural fashion, there is people that are brought down to earth, endowed by heaven, with such art, talent, and beauty, that everything they do is divinely inspired. And that everything they do comes from God, and not of human art. But Leonardo wasn't a mystic. Leonardo was a human. Human that was fallible. He made mistakes. He simply sought out to work hard at the things that allowed him to be such an innovator. So when you guys go back to your daily routines next week, strive to be a little bit more like Leonardo. Don't take things for granted that you used to. Look at it from the both perspective of science and art. Perhaps the way the light came, comes through the window in your apartment. Or maybe the way the stethoscope feels in your hand when you're listening to breath sounds and heart sounds. When you're counting those breath sounds and heart sounds. Marvel at that. When you talk to your patients with their history of present illness or with a significant other, pay attention to the way their facial features change as they discuss different things. Go out of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to stretch yourself. These are the seeds of innovation. Sit with someone that you haven't spoken to before, 30 minutes, an hour, once a week. The universe has an interesting way to talk to people. There is no one package in which wisdom and knowledge comes in. It could be your six-year-old nephew reminding you of the simplicities of life. It could be a patient that comes in with terminal disease. It could be the old lady sitting next to you, four glasses of wine in on the way to Vegas, teaching you about the truths of life. You never know. But go out, talk to someone, learn about them, learn something new, stretch yourself. And like any rebel or misfit of any age, I challenge you, think differently. Thank you. <laughs>